is the Omaha Bar Association's Just the Basics series on election law. Today you'll be hearing from Josh Wolf of the Douglas County Attorney's Office, Eric Anderson and Katie Figgins of Election Systems and Software here in Omaha, and finally you'll be hearing from Daniel Gutman, a private practice attorney here in Omaha. For those who want CLE credit, this has been approved for one hour of on-demand CLE credit in Nebraska and Iowa. To receive your credit, please email dave at omahabarassociation.com, and there will be a small invoice for completing the seminar. Enjoy. Uh, like Dave mentioned, my name is Josh Wolf. I am with the Douglas County Attorney's Office, and um, it's sort of interesting how I came into working with the Election Commission. I Most of what I do, my bread and butter is litigation, um, but working for a sort of general civil practice like the Civil Division of the County Attorney's Office, we all do a little bit extra as well. So in late 2019, um, I was approached by my supervisor and asked if I would take on a couple departments that were you know, pretty low maintenance. They didn't really require much because I was doing so much litigation. And those were the election commission and the health department. <laughs> so that was a very pleasant treat in 2020. Um, and I, you know, allowed me to do a little bit of litigation for both of those departments, actually. Uh, I figured I would get started by just giving everyone sort of a very brief um, background and history of the current election law system that we have in place in Nebraska. Um, the current system was put into effect about 100-ish years ago in the early 1900s. Um, prior to the enactment of the current election act, the elections in Nebraska were actually uh, pretty ripe with fraud and control by what they referred to as the underworld or the crime bosses here in the Omaha area, which sounds really weird to hear about now, <laughs> the crime bosses in Omaha, but that was a thing a while ago. And um, you had the group of large money individuals, usually illegal money, that would fix the outcomes of primaries and elections to make sure that individuals that were going to be favorable to their business practices and the business practices of their compatriots were protected. Um, this eventually led to some massive reform of elections in Nebraska and in specifically in the Omaha area. Um, and that was the election law that was put into place was called the Dodge Honest Election Law. And that has in some iteration or another, it's been built on a little bit, but has existed here for approximately 100 years. Um, when this first happened, a Senate committee was created to investigate the elections, determine if there were issues, and the, this law that we have in place was pushed forward as the solution. I'm just going to read to you a little bit so you can get an idea of sort of the things that were going on there. The Senate committee pushed and was able to get permission to open up a box of sealed ballots that had already been counted and um, certified. And the committee report says, on the face of the returns in the second precinct of the third ward, the city of Omaha, contestant received 18 votes and the incumbent received 278 votes. Upon an inspection and recount of the ballots, your committee found that the context contestant actually received 103 votes as opposed to the 18 that was reported <laughs> and the incumbent 308 being a gain for the contestant of 85 votes and for the incumbent of 30. Um, your committee are convinced that in the voting precincts in question the election boards were composed of men who were grossly ignorant incompetent and totally indifferent to their duties and to the rights of the candidates. So you can see things were not going well for Nebraska uh, when they decided to take some action. And they, uh, as you can imagine, the Dodge Honest Election Law passed with broad support across all members of the Senate, except with those few who were believed to be controlled by what they refer to as the machines 
for the gangs of Omaha. Um, now in Nebraska, our current structure, we have a, sort of a dual system that happens. Um, because we have several counties that contain the bulk of the population of the state, and then a number of smaller counties with much smaller populations, we have two ways that the elections are run in Nebraska. In counties under 100,000 inhabitants, the clerk of the county runs the election. In counties over 100,000 inhabitants, there is appointed an election commissioner, and that election commissioner must appoint a chief deputy election commissioner. Now, because they were concerned with checks and balances and making sure that one party or one system or one the machine didn't gain control, the election commissioners in a county over 100,000 individuals are appointed by the governor and the governor may remove those individuals. So even though they operate within a county and are employees of that county and are paid by that county, they are put in place by the governor and they can be removed by the governor. That election commissioner must appoint a chief deputy election commissioner and that chief deputy must belong to a different political party than the election commissioner which means that generally in a state like Nebraska, you have a series of Republican election commissioners and Democratic chief deputy election commissioners. Um, you said the commissioner is the one who, who selects their deputy though? The commissioner selects their deputy, I believe. I'd have to double check, but I'm like 90% sure that's accurate. Um, and they must select it from a different political party. So whether that be an, an independent or a Democrat, it just has to be a different political party. Um, and so together they sort of, you know, under the supervision of the secretary of state, who is an elected official, um, run elections within the counties. Um, and so in, in Nebraska, that means Lancaster, Sarpy, and Douglas have election commissioners and chief deputy election commissioners. And I believe uh, as we sit now, every other county in Nebraska, the elections are run by the county clerk. Um, in Nebraska, the Secretary of State is the chief election officer, and the Election Act imposes upon the Secretary of State certain duties and certain powers. I'm not going to go through all of them. Broadly speaking, the Secretary of State is tasked with supervising and regulating the conduct of elections. Um, promulgating rules and regulations for elections and deciding disputed points of election law. Um, and the election commissioners report to the Secretary of State. So you don't really have any ability within the city of Omaha or Douglas County or city council or the county commissioners to influence the way that an election commissioner runs elections within that county which was important to the people who created the law so that you wouldn't have issues of undue influence being exerted by the people within the county whose elections were being run. Um, uh, however, I will note that the county still largely put the bill for everything. <laughs> um, uh, the, that structure that was in place for about 100 years was largely unchallenged until 2019. I'm not saying it's my fault, but it was mere months after I took <laughs> over as counsel for the election commission. Um, at the request of a state senator, the attorney general issued an opinion that stated that the system in place in Nebraska whereby election commissioners were appointed was unconstitutional. Um, Article 9, Section 4 of the Nebraska Constitution requires that county officers be elected. And the attorney general performed an analysis under the Supreme Court case of TUSA, which is TUSA for those interested, mm -hmm. um, and concluded that the election commissioners met the criteria for being a public officer. Um, now, public officer, in my opinion, and as I argued, does mm -hmm. not mean county officer. Um, there was well, I won't give my opinion on that, <laughs> on that opinion. Suffice it to say, the opinion was issued. It concluded that the current system was unconstitutional and relying on that opinion, um, the governor refused to 
appoint Douglas County's election commissioner for 2020, which was when he was due to be reappointed, um, which squared off the Secretary of State and the governor who believed the current system to be appropriate against the attorney general who believed it to be unconstitutional, which is really awkward because the attorney general is the lawyer technically for those individuals. Um, and so in order to resolve that, the secretary of state filed suit against the, I'm sorry, the attorney general filed suit against the secretary of state and the governor. They went first directly to the Supreme Court but because they were unable to agree on a set of stipulated facts, the Supreme Court said, get out. And they kicked <laughs> the case uh, and said, go file it down in district court. We're not a fact finding court. We're not gonna do that. Um, and they refused, to, they did not, they declined to appoint a special master to do any fact finding. And so the case was refiled in Lancaster district court, this time adding um, the Douglas County Election Commissioner, Sarpy County Election Commissioner, and Lancaster County Election Commissioner as defendants to the lawsuit. Um, Secretary of State and the Governor retained independent counsel since they couldn't use the AG. And <laughs> the Douglas County, Sarpy County, and Lancaster County uh, Election Commissioners and Chief Deputy Election Commissioners um, were folded into that representation and represented by them as well. Um, Douglas, Sarpy, and Lancaster at the district court level and the Supreme Court level did file joint amicus briefs in support of the current election system that is in place. Um, at the district court level, the judge agreed that they were not county officers as contemplated by Article 9, Section 4, and therefore did not need to be elected. That, of course, was kicked up bypassed the Court of Appeals and went directly to the Supreme Court, um, had argument sometime in 2020, and the Supreme Court also agreed that um, our Constitution gives the legislature broad power to decide who is and who isn't a county officer, and that county, county election commissioners were not, for purposes of Article 9, county officers that needed to be elected. So the current system stands as it was originally enacted, and um, we still have an election commissioner here in Douglas County, who is, some of you may already have received your ballots, uh, if you do the vote by mail, and uh, is proceeding forward. And that's sort of a general overview of the current system, and uh, how we got to where we are, and how it sort of functions today. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Eric Anderson. I'm general counsel for election systems and software. This is my colleague, Katie Biggins. She's my associate general counsel. I've been with the company about 21 years, actually the first and only general counsel that the company has had. And Katie's been with me about two years. Uh, there was one person in her role previous to that who still works for the company in a non-legal role. But uh, a little bit about us and then kind of what we do. We've been around about 40 years, headquartered here in Omaha, privately owned company. We are the largest election system provider in, in the world. Uh, we've got about 60% of the US domestic market. Um, as you all might recall, back in 2000, we had the uh, Bush v. Gore case and the uh, election debacle around the punch cards. And uh, I joined the company not long thereafter, I think, because the company realized that, you know, they had enough legal work to justify in-house positions. Previously, was using exclusively outside counsel, which we still do to a large extent. But, um, you know, there's, there, as far as the laws that affect our operations, you know, there are federal election laws that govern the conduct of federal elections. There are state election laws that govern the conduct of state elections. Katie and I don't have to deal with those very much because contrary to what you might hear a lot of the pundits say, as election vendors, we don't conduct elections. We support the conduct of elections. We develop and manufacture voting machines, the software that's used in conjunction with those, we print ballots, and we provide services around that. So she and I focus more so with the regulation of our industry and our company in particular and the things we have to deal with in that regard. Um, 
I would say one of the biggest areas that we have to deal with as an election system provider is uh, regulation by the Election Assistance Commission, which is a federal agency that was created back in 2002 when the Help America Vote Act was adopted, and that came out of the uh, you know the ashes of the Florida debacle. And under the Help America Vote Act, um, the EAC was established, and then the EAC was charged with establishing what are known as voluntary voting system guidelines, and those are federal guidelines as to how voting systems have to function, the security features, the accessibility features. Um, even though that law was adopted in 2002, it took three to four years before the EAC members were even constituted. And the first set of uh, voluntary voting system guidelines was adopted. There have been three sets of guidelines. There was a version back in 2005, followed by one in, I don't know, the second one was not long thereafter, a couple, three years. And then most recently in 2021, the most recent version of the guidelines have been adopted. Well, 2022, Those, they were adopted. Yeah, yeah. okay. Those contain a lot more security related requirements of voting systems. Um, so a big part of our business is to not only develop and manufacture voting systems, but we have to get them certified at both the federal level and state levels before they can be marketed and sold to, to customers. Again, our customers are primarily counties, counties and municipalities and home rural states. That's who conducts the elections. The election vendors don't, the counties and, and local, local uh, jurisdictions do. So we spent a lot of time and money internally on developing and testing voting systems before they're even presented to what are known as voting system test labs. There's only two of those in existence that have been accredited by the EAC. So once we have a system that we think we're ready to submit, then it goes through six to nine months of testing by a VISTAL, as it's called, a voting system test lab. There's back and forth that goes on with, with that test lab. You know, you got to change this, you got to change that. They do source code review. They do, you know, end-to-end -end testing of the system. There's a million mark test where you know, the system has to accurately mark 100 ballots, you know, if it's a paper uh, tabulator situation. Um, and then once the VISTAL is completed as testing and issued a report, that goes to the AC commissioners, and then they have to certify the voting system. Once that occurs, then we have to approach the states. 35 states right now require an EAC certification before you even come to them to apply for state level certification. Some states only want the distal test. Some states have their own testing like New York and Florida where they don't, they don't care about the EAC. You've got to apply to them and run through their own round of tests and pass their certification testing. So. We're a highly regulated business and, and mostly with respect to the certification of our voting systems. We have to deal with a lot of compliance issues. Um, there's various states and EAC that have certain anomalies as they're poorly defined occur in an election. Katie is charged with a lot of that of reporting these anomalies most of the time, nine out of 10 times it's human error that occurs, you know, with poll workers and that. But uh, the, the reporting obligations are pretty ominous. So around a, the conduct of elections, certain period of time leading up to an election and during an election, we've got very short timelines to report these anomalies to the, the states that, you know, Indiana is one that comes to mind um, and the EAC. And then they, they do their own investigation. And ultimately, we have to you know, inform them as to how we resolved these anomalies and what happened uh, in the field. Um, but that's, that's kind of the big picture of who we are and what we do. Uh, we're privately owned, as I said, headquartered here in Omaha. Um, it's a very interesting business, never a dull moment. In this political never. environment, as you can imagine, uh, you know, it, uh, it's a very small industry. There's probably really only three large companies. It's, it's ES&S and it's Dominion Voting Systems, as you've seen in the news since 2020. Okay. And another company by the name of Hard Inner Civic, who's probably number three in size, and then a couple little guys. but. The barriers to entry are so great with the certification process. You know, when, when HAVA was first passed, the federal government put over $4 billion in the market to replace voting systems. You know, they outlawed punch cards and everybody was chasing that money. So a lot of people came out of the woodwork thinking they were going to be voting system vendors and realized this isn't going to work. Um, so really, there's been three that have survived. Um, and... Uh, it's, it's, it's a crazy business, crazy industry. Uh, so what's the timeline um, from 
uh, when did they secure you as as their vendor before an election? You know, say so we have an election, you know, next month. How long out are they making those contracts with what, you? What do we hope? What do yeah, we hope? hope? That it is? Yeah. Yeah. The longer, you know, the longer the better. You know, it's it's a very cyclical business. You know, even years are busier than odd years, and, and general election years are the busiest. Normally, a jurisdiction, if they are in the market, secure a new voting system, and that all comes down to do they do they have the money? Do they have did they have federal money out of HAVA, or do they now have some state level money? You know, ideally, they would procure it in an odd year to give them plenty of time to implement the system, train on the system, uh, and get familiar with it, rather than just prior to, you know, a primary election in an even year and a general in an even year. So, you know, we're busy with services all the time because, you know, you don't realize that there's an election, there's elections that go on every, every week, of yeah. every year in this yeah. country, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's dog catcher or, or what have you. <clears throat> right. Um, so, you know, we're always busy with uh, providing services, but uh, very cyclical business. I mean, HAVA 2006 was the biggest year this company has ever had because that's when finally the EAC was in place and the voluntary voting system guidelines had been adopted and, and jurisdictions started spending some real money to replace the voting system. So, you know, we try to say that a voting system is good 10 to 15 years. So we've been back in that cycle since 06. Uh, you know, we've had some big years since then with the replacement of voting systems. And what is the, the system of choice right now uh, out there? Well, we've got, we've got kind of a hybrid system. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a system where there is an electronic touch screen. You know, you've got components for the disabled. You've got a Braille keypad. You've got sip and puff. You've got enlarged font. And, and our, our probably our, our most current version is one where there's a blank card that's inserted, a voter votes on that screen, and then the selections are printed on that card, and then that card is tabulated in a separate tabulator. So, so but there's, there's a paper trail is kind of the key. Oh, yeah. oh with people who can't use their arms and legs. Sip and puff. Sip and puff, yeah. yeah. And yeah. paddles. Sip and know, puff, yeah. For a paraplegic. Or a quad, quadriplegic. Quadriplegic. Yeah. Yeah. Or anybody yeah. And we have audio, user. you know, audio mm -hmm. where you can listen to the ballot read to you. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah. you know, it went from punch cards to pure electronic. We had a system known as the electronic. It was purely electronic, no paper involved, other than a, a you know, a uh, roll that kept all the action, the record of all the actions on there. So now more of a hybrid where there is a piece of paper called a ballot, but you put it in a machine, you vote electronically, that your selections are printed on that card, that's read by a tabulator and that's kept for recount purposes. The voter doesn't get to see the card necessarily. Yeah, they'll handle the card. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's confirmed that. And, right. and a card will be ejected, depending on how the jurisdiction conducts it. Some jurisdictions right. will have depending the card. The state yeah, we'll have the card deposited directly into a ballot box. Some it will eject it back to the voter and they will take it over to a separate tabulator and deposit it in that. Some you can tabulator. review just in the bin. The bin will hold it. You can review the bin and then you say it cast your vote without actually coming out. So right. they can't manipulate it. Right. But then it'll, you can review it in the bin and then, you then can they can cast it. it. The, yeah. And then you can, or you could say, nope, disregard, you know, burn that ballot. I'm, we're going to no, issue a provisional. Yeah. Depending on how the state law of the jurisdiction is. Yeah. Another variation of the system I've been talking about is back in some of the eastern states that had the old lever machines, yeah. where it was a full face ballot presentation where a voter would see every race and every candidate, they still hung on to that. So we've developed what's called an XL version, extra large version of this electronic voting system. So on an electronic screen, you see the entire ballot at the same time. Huge. That's in New Jersey. It's coming in New York, um, but uh, I mean that's the requirement. Louisiana, Louisiana, right? It's a whole ballot, a whole full yeah. face of the ballot. Yeah, at a certain yeah typeface, so the yeah. screen is. Giant. So we have to have products that address <clears throat> local, you know, state requirements as far as how ballots are presented and how they are tabulated and how things are reported. That's what we have to comply with. Is that? Now, let me ask a completely unfair question. Are there other countries that have this totally different in any jurisdiction election hodgepodge that we have in the United States? Or are we kind of alone in the world with how we run our elections so differently in different locales? 
Well, Does we, know that? I, 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 you know, I would, I'm speculating. We have customers I gotta believe in it. Canada. I mean, we, yeah, we yeah. use our equipment in Canada and right. different local. Well, the city, the municipal elections run their own municipal elections with our mm -hmm. equipment, uh, have internet voting. So, I, I mean, yeah. so it's, it's somewhat and, similar and Canada, there. Canada, yeah. they're, they're on, on generally a three-year election cycle up there, and they are mostly a rental market for us. They tend to rent their machines. You know, Toronto bought a system from us, but most jurisdictions, they can't justify buying a system. Um, so they will rent from us. But as far as back to your original question, Dave, based on my understanding, I think we are unique in the United States that every state can be so different. <laughs> exceptional. We are exceptional. Yeah, we're exceptional. <laughs> I think I think normally it's a it's a country level, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and and other Jersey, yeah. other parts just of the world. Like say most countries are the same as the U.S. state. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any other That's questions true. for me before we go to Katie? Yeah. yeah. I was just going to ask you. Yes. So I assume your business model depends partially on people believing in the integrity of elections. Okay. I mean, if you don't have that, then I mean, you, you may be viewed as as the source of that, right? And so, do you have to spend money and time? Kind of with that narrative, or is that? Do you just leave that? To I mean, dealing side? with the voters directly, and and what? Yeah, I what mean, they I trust what they want, what they believe in. If, yeah. if a state, for example, doesn't like, if 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 a group of people don't believe in the integrity of the election system, and that narrative is being pushed, I mean, do you have to counter that narrative because you are the election system, or not? We we have to deal with a lot of. And, and inquiries and yeah we have to we have to pacify the masses that the systems are safe and secure and reliable and you know you can trust them we deal with that on a daily basis yeah. we've got a whole government relations That's what department okay. yeah. Yeah. and we the great part is that. everything's backed up by paper so yeah. we can say oh okay don't trust us go count your ballots yeah. well, go, other, go other, to your cast vote records go, thing, go do your own audit yeah, i thing, mean you don't have to trust us. Yeah, you yeah. can do it yourself. The, the other thing is, you know, nothing is done over the internet. You know, contrary to some some belief. I mean, it's all hardened systems. There would have to be massive collusion of people to pull off, you know, election fraud. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a point of context. Um, in Nebraska, what we do, we Nebraska is our, our customer. That's public knowledge. Uh, Nebraska is our customer. What we do specifically for Nebraska is their ADA equipment. So if you see the white boxes, um, those are express boats. Um, and that is a piece of equipment that we sell. Um, and we also do the central scanner. So the central scanners are when you put your, your ballot into the box at the end of the day, it all goes to a central location and is counted on a machine that's just like the Scantron machine uh, that you used at the you know, in school, uh, that Scantron machine counts all the ballots, and then we have the software uh, to tabulate all of those um, counts. So I just want to give you a little bit of context of what it is that we do here locally. Um, that varies in other locations. Sorry, go ahead. Confusingly, Scantron is actually an Omaha company as well, right? <laughs> I don't know. Is it? There's a lot. Of, <laughs> oh, it's there's a lot. It's kind of a lot. Same it's brothers, a, right? This isn't there. I mean, she's saying similar. In, right. Similar. In not, it's not the yeah, same. Yeah. Right, right. A digital scanner. Definitely yeah. different. High-speed digital scanner. Right. Okay. Definitely different yeah. in every way, yeah. <laughs> according <laughs> to our intellectual property yeah. patents. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. Very important. Yeah. Very important to know. Um, I guess what I've done and what people usually ask me about, um, oh, but what have I been extremely busy uh, this year with is public record requests. Um, there's been, I'm sure you've seen in the news or in the media that there has been an extreme, extreme, extreme level of public record requests to every election official within this country. And it doesn't stop in Nebraska, it doesn't stop in Douglas County, it is all over the nation and to every public official. I mean, you, you're, you're seeing counties that only have 600 residents have nine or 10 you know, public record requests, something that they could not absolutely handle you know, all year because their election clerk is, also does 19 other jobs uh, within the county. Um, and so we've seen a lot of those. And um, we at ESNS, um, you know, obviously we are not a governmental entity and we are not subject to public record laws. Um, 
but we, uh, as a third party with uh, our proprietary systems within those counties and states, we can make up certain objections uh, to the disclosure of certain public records. Um, so those objections include, you know, our, our trade secret and our proprietary or commercial materials, um, which would include our manuals. Um, and, and out of their documents, I'm not just saying it stops at manuals, but that's the most common one. And then other security objections that we may have uh, to the release for security concerns. Most states within the you know, most states within the United States have some sort of exemption for security concerns. Um, you, you've seen most of these uh, because there's a 22 month uh, retention policy on all election materials. Um, so approximately two to three weeks before that 22 months was up, a man named Mike Lindell hosted, <laughs> who, sell, who happens to sell pillows, um, uh, hosted a conference and basically told all of the people at that conference that, you know, every jurisdiction in the United States is going to destroy everything 2020 related if you don't start sending out public record requests right now. Uh, which is not necessarily the case, but anyway, that's when you just saw everybody just be extremely overloaded with public record requests in every jurisdiction of the state and, and us as well. Uh, we got thousands and thousands and thousands of emails all at the same time. Um, so it's been quite an adventurous last few months for us. <laughs> um, just I, I, I doing a lot of education uh, for our own customers and um, doing a lot of briefing, third-party briefing uh, for different materials. And, um, you know, um, so it, certain states have different, different procedures and how to um, respond to your objections. Uh, Texas has a very formal procedure, um, which includes writing briefing to the AG. Essentially the county states, hey, I got this, uh, public record request, and we county think that these things uh, within that public record request should not be disclosed, and they uh, do that through briefing process that it has to include the, the requester and uh, the AG, and they submit that through the AG, and then we have an opportunity to brief that as well. Um, so you, uh, so, and then we say, we also agree that these certain things shouldn't be disclosed because they involve our proprietary interests. And um, here's a whole brief as to why that is. So you can imagine uh, what happened in the last two months. Uh, there was a significant amount of briefs written to the Texas AG um, from all the different vendors, but a significant amount of briefs uh, all went in at the same time. We're still awaiting decisions on that, um, but it's been a very interesting uh, last couple of months with that. Yeah, I'd, I would add just a couple of things to that. Along the lines of, of applicable exemptions from disclosure that we try to rely upon is uh, the Department of Homeland Security designated election systems as critical infrastructure. So under our security arguments, we try to hang our hat on that as one of the arguments to not disclose certain materials that you're jeopardizing the potential integrity of the system and the ability of bad actors to do bad things. Uh, the other thing, you know, Katie works uh, quite extensively in this area and, you know, most jurisdictions ask for and, and welcome and appreciate our input on what we think they shouldn't disclose. Unfortunately, we have found out on the West Coast in California and Washington that those jurisdictions will disclose everything unless we file a lawsuit and seek you know, injective relief. So we've had to spend some serious money on little lawsuits out there to stop the disclosure of things that we just do not want them to disclose. So they, they won't even voluntarily do it. They make us go file a lawsuit. And we've been successful, but it's unfortunate that that's their their procedure out there. And to be and to be fair, it's it's not minor documents that we. I mean, we don't yeah. go chasing down minor documents yeah. that yeah. poll workers see. What what we, I mean, kind of, and the benefit of us, but also for the country as a whole, don't want to release documentation that says how to change security passcodes within software. We don't want to, you know, those sort of really top line. Um, security issues that that we know 
that these documents are going straight to the internet once disclosed. I mean, they, they have a depository that we know that these people that are requesting these things are just sending it straight to the internet depository where it'll be worldwide for any hacker to see. So, I mean, that's the, the stuff that we go after is, is the security stuff. I mean, that's, that's primarily what we, you know, don't want our source code out there. We don't want passwords out there. We don't want the internal structures out there uh, for any Joe, Dick, or Harry to see. Is there a new pricing uh, component for the West Coast now? <laughs> there should be. There should, I mean, the unfortunate thing is we don't have that much business out there either. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, California is a whole other country. Yeah. If I can, just to jump on what you were saying about it being posted to the internet and everyone seeing it, it's not just hyperbole. Like the Douglas County Election Commission has seen tremendous increase in public records requests. Many of them are copy and paste. They don't even fill in blank. No. <laughs> it's obvious that they have. <laughs> copied and pasted it somewhere who will be like I request this from blank jurisdiction and they don't even fill it in yeah <laughs> and so it's funny it is, they it is absolutely yeah, being posted out there for people and you'll go back to them and then you'll say well what do you mean by x y and z and the requester will go well, I don't know, I, don't know. <laughs> I was just told to request it yeah. like I so they most of the requesters don't know themselves what they're even asking for and so it's a certain amount of guessing and a certain amount of education that you have to provide your customers um, because requests will come in just for things that don't exist because these people think it exists, but just because they think it exists doesn't mean it exists. Another yeah. challenge sometimes is, is a jurisdiction will think they have some obligation to create a record that doesn't exist. That should, and, and they mm -hmm. don't. And they'll come to us and say, hey, can you give us this? And we're like, no, no. You, don't have it. you don't have an obligation to produce it. We're not going to create something that you don't already have in your possession. So there's a lot of education part of this too, especially mm -hmm. with some smaller jurisdictions that maybe aren't, you know, consulting with their own legal counsel. Did you mention online voting for Canada? Is that something that they do up there? Completely online? No. They they have an online component for some city elections, right. but we don't do any of that. We don't do any of that work uh, at yeah, the that's, that's Not us. Um, yeah. But you you become. Uakava. Uakava yeah. has a certain amount of so. elements to so. email voting. Yeah. Uakava within the United States. Yeah. yeah. For military and overseas. Military and overseas. To be able to get uh, their ballot back. Yeah. Right. Electronically. Right. So they have a, a cert, again, some not a service that we provide uh, at ESNES, but um, there is that. Um, my name is Daniel Gutman. I have my own practice. I do a lot of um, election law with candidates, so campaign finance, like we were talking about, and some FEC stuff. But my real interest is uh, ballot initiatives. And so these folks talked about uh, ballots and printing ballots and counting ballots. The folks that I work with are just trying to get on the ballot. Um, so that's the process that I'm talking about. And a little bit of just kind of historical context. You know, at the time of the founding, the federal constitution, the framers, granted all legislative power to the people who would then go to the states and delegate the legislative power that they had as they saw fit. Um, I think it's the majority of states have delegated that legislative power exclusively in their legislature. Um, so most states, you know, they take legislative power, they say, all of our legislative power is put into this legislature who will pass laws, right? Nebraska did something a little bit different. They took their legislative power, they delegated it partially to the legislature, our unicameral, and then we reserved legislative power for ourselves. So in the state constitution, um, again, there is a delegation of legislative power to the legislature and there is a delegation of legislative power to the people. And what that means, that's why you hear people in Nebraska say the people are the second house what they mean by that, of course, is the legislature can pass laws, but so can the people. And that's kind of a unique structure. Not, I can't remember the exact breakdown, but I don't think it's the majority. I think we're in a minority of states that have the initiative power reserved to the people. Um, so along with that legislative power that is provided in the state constitution, 
And there was kind of a progressive wave in the early 1900s where, you know, I think it started in North Dakota and South Dakota, Nebraska, you know, Kansas, that was recently in the news for the referendum power. Um, but a lot of the Midwest states have the initiative and referendum power, but a lot of people are mistaken in thinking that that exists in every state, which it does not. Um, but along with the initiative power that the Constitution grants, the Constitution kicks some of the authority to the legislature to govern how the initiative process works. And so the legislature passes laws about, you may have heard of the single subject rule and stuff like that, which governs how an initiative can be uh, placed on the ballot. There's a lot of litigation around that um, right before an initiative is to be certified for the ballot. Uh, we brought a lawsuit this past year for a rule that's actually in the state constitution. So it's not a legislative rule, it's a constitutional rule. And essentially what it said was in 1912, there was an amendment to the state constitution, added the initiative right. And one of the many things that it added along with the initiative right is a requirement that signatures be gathered, not only in quantity and bulk, but spread throughout the state. So you have to get 5% of registered voters in 38 of Nebraska, or excuse me, yeah, in 38 of Nebraska's 93 counties to sign. So you, in layman's terms, you can't get all your signatures from Omaha and Lincoln, right? You gotta go out, you gotta collect 5% of registered voters in 38 counties. Um, we challenged that law um, this go around on behalf of Nebraskans for Medical Marijuana. Yeah, you're probably not gonna get a lot of signatures out in small counties for that one. Well, actually they got a ton. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a resource problem more than a support problem. Um, so, and the lawsuit we brought was on behalf of Nebraskans for Medical Marijuana, but it wasn't exclusive to them, right? Like if we prevail on that, then no matter what your issue is, the law is gonna change. But it's a, it's a really resource intensive project, right? To go out to all these different counties. And so we filed a lawsuit based on um, the Equal Protection Clause of the federal constitution. And our argument was essentially that, you know, 5% of the registered voters in Arthur County is 18 voters. 5% of the registered voters in Douglas County is 18,000 voters. So our argument, and we were paid, there's a lot of other states that have brought this argument and have been successful. But our argument was that a signature in Arthur County is worth a whole hell of a lot more than a signature in Douglas County. Because if you go get 18 people in Arthur County, you have qualified Arthur County. So that signature holds so much more weight than the signature of a voter in Douglas County. And if, if you believe that signatures in this process are maybe not the equivalent, but are close to the equivalent of a vote, you've got an issue of vote dilution, right? And so we essentially brought, for lack of a better term, and for uh, I, and for the sake of time, uh, we essentially brought a vote dilution lawsuit, saying that this provision was unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. We brought it in federal district court. And um, we got an injunction at the district court level saying that this what we were likely to succeed on the merits. This was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause or likely a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and it was temporarily enjoined from being enforced uh, through the Secretary of State. But that was later appealed to the Eighth Circuit. And after a bunch of litigation there, we ended up getting a split panel decision with us in the minority. And so they reversed the injunction and we are back to the 38 county rule as being held constitutional. So, and it, there's a little bit of a split there. You know, there's, like I said, there's a number of states and federal uh, circuits that have basically invalidated the same requirement that we have. I mean, not even like, it's no different. <laughs> um, so we were kind of relying on that precedent but the Eighth Circuit uh, disagreed. And so a change would have to come from the legislature at this point since the courts have decided that there's no, no change from their side? Yeah, I mean, well, there's, yeah, there's a couple other areas that it could be challenged, but, um, 
But yeah, more or less, it would have to be a change to the Constitution. Which requires in the legislature, well, no, the Constitution is a ballot initiative. Right? Well, it could be through a ballot initiative. Um, it could, I don't know all the ways off the top of my head that you can change it, but I think you could get it through a supermajority of the legislature, which would then kick it to a vote of the people. Um, but, and that's, that's actually how it was passed originally in 1912, is they had a legislative body, they voted on it, and then it got kicked to the people who voted on it as well. So that's a very abridged version of that, but that, that's kind of the area that I focused on is ballot initiatives and um, kind of the step before the actual, you know, how do you get on the ballot? What was the final count on the medical marijuana? Where did they come short? Were there some 17 votes instead of 18 votes in the couple counties? They, they had, they submitted, um, I want to say 97,000. They needed 87,000. Usually what ballot initiative uh, campaign committees do is they um, try and get 20, 30,000 extra to cover uh, for, for signatures that are validated. Um, I think that the final that they got was 82. Um, not all the signatures were counted and the Secretary of State's office said that they were gonna count the ones that haven't been, but we haven't gotten that number yet. So we don't have a final tally on the total number, but basically the Secretary of State said, you were short on both the total number and the county requirement. Do you happen to know how much was spent on collecting signatures that campaign? Well, so what you'll see in the press, which is true, is to pass a ballot initiative or to get a ballot on the, uh, or to get a, uh, an initiative on the ballot, it costs about a million dollars, 1.5 million. I would say this is rough justice here, but 90% of that 1.5 million is on signature collectors. And that's because of the 38 county rule, right? Like you have to bring in people from out of state, pay them, you know, last time I heard there was one campaign that's um, out there that recently qualified that was paying $10 uh, a signature. The $15 minimum? Uh, I, I don't know if it was that, but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. awkward. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so so there's you have to pay there's there is firm signature firms that specialize in just getting signatures. They usually bring in people from out of state. They send them out throughout the state. They target 38 counties, usually more like 40 so that they can cover just in case. And they spend a ton of money getting people out there, getting the signatures, qualifying. So when you hear stuff like, oh, it costs millions of dollars to get something on the ballot, that is true. And the vast majority of those resources are spent on signature collectors. Now, medical marijuana, this last go around, didn't have the funding. They were pretty much all volunteer, which is, you know, it's, in, it's incredible that they got 97,000 signatures on a volunteer basis. That's never been done before. Um, obviously, it wasn't enough. And so they're not satisfied with that. But ultimately, you need a million bucks and you need, you need to hire a signature firm. And can, can you remind us on the history? Last time it was on the ballot, ballot, or last time they tried to do this, it was not a single issue, and that's yeah. why I got kicked. Yeah, so in 2020, they did have funding. I think that they had something like 1.7 million from funders in 2020. They went out, they had a constitutional change as opposed to a statutory, which requires more signatures. They got those signatures, Secretary of State counted them, verified that they had enough and then the secretary of state did his own vetting said yes i think this should be certified for the ballot and then about two weeks before the ballots were going to go out there was litigation filed um, by terry wagner who's a lancaster county sheriff saying basically um, this provision cannot go on the ballot because it violates the single subject rule and the single subject rule um you know no one really knows what it means but Essentially, what it is, is that a ballot initiative cannot have more than one subject. What they don't want is saying, you know, having on one ballot, you know, vote for this and it, it will legalize gambling and lower your property taxes. Well, somebody might want their property tax lowered, but they don't like gambling and they're forced in this position of having to vote on something they like for something that they don't. The purposes of the, of the single subject rule is to disallow that kind of 
combination. And that was the, the state Supreme Court? So it was a mandamus action filed directly in the state Supreme Court. The argument was in 2020 that it violated the single subject rule and the Supreme Court agreed. And the remedy for a violation of the single subject rule is it's not placed on the ballot. So the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court issued an order preventing Secretary of State Bob Evnen from placing it on the, on the ballot. Had they printed the, the documents yet? Or the, no, the, the, no. It, yeah. So you have the way that the, lit the litigation is very expedited. And, but the point is, is they, the Secretary of State needs a decision from the Supreme Court on these challenges before the ballot's printed. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it's it's kind of a super expedited process. And the Supreme Court issues an opinion and says yes or no. We don't mind printing two sets of ballots. And so you, you guys do do ballot printing, but sometimes that's outsourced to a different party. Yeah, we've we got have. partner printers uh, in various jurisdictions across the country. I mean, we have printing facility, our largest printing facility is in Birmingham, Alabama. We do a lot of our own printing, but we have partners. We don't, we don't print all of our customers' ballots. We don't, yeah, we don't need to, uh, it's not a... And if, if a state is using your systems, there are employees in the state that are helping them with that? Or is that not necessarily... Yeah, well, we, we have account managers and, and on election day, we send out what are called site support personnel that, you know, go out for three days a day before, day of and day after and help support the elections. And we have technicians that are out there, you know, addressing any machine issues. So yeah, that's part of the supporting is wrapping services all around that voting system. And we do a lot of training before an election. So we do a, like a train the trainer thing. So so everybody knows how to support that machinery yeah. as well. I mean, there's a, I mean, New York, for example, there's a whole outfit of people that know how to maintenance the machine that don't work for ESNS, but know how to maintenance the machines, know how to work with machines, know how to fix, you know, uh, because we provide that that resource to our customers. So it's not necessarily our. I'm kind of bummed that uh, Jake Steinkeffer didn't show up because when he was in New York City, he was an attorney, um, Republican attorney that was actually like they're watching everything go down like they had the attorneys from each party that, that were doing that and like i mean he, he would just you know they'd tell him to go out here he'd go out here it was it like the the machine out there for how they're poll watching and it's and a ma it's, it's definitely a machine yeah. in fact they have attorneys that'll come around saying this machine needs to be facing this direction and their attorneys do that tell them this machine need to be facing that direction and this is not right with the code of whatever. I mean, right. it's that level of detail that, you know, it's facing the wrong direction. It's the attorney that will tell them in the room. It's, 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 it's a whole new world, but it's, it is quite the complex, amazing system. Up there. What were the, if you remember, what were the two subjects that you said by the Supreme Court started coming down there? Well, they actually said there were seven subjects. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Oh, I, I think the wording was, at least seven. Um, so I mean, basically, it was a complex. It was a complex team, and I I didn't draft help draft the language in 2020. I've seen it in the opinion, but I'm not super familiar with it. But it was an expansive legalization of medical cannabis for growing and using. And you know, basically, the Supreme Court said, for example, growing medical cannabis is not natural and necessary to using it. Now, a lot of people disagree with that, but that was, you know, that was some of the reasoning is so, and the remedy again is not that you can't, now you can't do medical cannabis, but you've got to separate them into different ballots. So that's why you'll see circulators, they'll say, we wanna do X, Y, Z, can you sign all three petitions? And what they mean by that is we're worried that all, if we combine all three, it's gonna be a single subject violation. So we're separating them into three separate ones. This is quintessential, like, lawyers need to be here to, to be the guardians of all this, right? I mean, this is, this is kind of part of the profession, kind of the importance of the lawyers to you know, make sure we get this right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, luckily we have, I mean, we really do, like, I've been on a lot of calls recently about election day and, you know, making sure the machines are pointing the right way and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but I think, you know, at the conclusion of most of these calls, like, we have really good elections. 
construction workers in Nebraska. And we don't like this. I have not heard a sense of like, we think people are trying to game the system. So at the end of the day, like you gotta be prepared for anything that could happen. But the presumption in this state at least is like people are just trying to do the right thing. And so that's a good, that's a good thing. We yeah. do have excellent, and I'll tell you, not just in Nebraska, all across the country, excellent election workers, amazing, dedicated individuals that are exceptional, just exceptional. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it makes you believe in what we do and believe in, you know, having a fair and free election because of such dedicated individuals all across the country that are, it, it's so important to them to just have a fair and free honest election they volunteer their time to do that um, and it's just absolutely impressive